Alright guys, welcome back to another video. So in this one we're going to be building a fairly simple nightstand with a few key design characteristics. So the first thing, and kind of the most important, is I really wanted a project to try staining cherry on. Now cherry is a wood that I, I really think it's an amazing wood to work with. It's one of my favorite woods to actually, you know, cut joinery in, to mill, to all, you know, all this stuff. Because you can use a good mixture of both hand tools and power tools to get amazing results. My only problem with cherry is that it only starts to look good after a couple years. You guys might have noticed recently I've done quite a few projects using cherry and what I found after having those sitting in my office, in my room for a little while now, is that they just, they don't look great. And I know that in a few years the cherry will age and they'll start to look a lot better. But right for right now, you know, I want to be able to enjoy the pieces of furniture I build now. I don't want to be able to enjoy them, you know, five or ten years from now. So that's why I'm trying to do some experimenting with stain. Now, I don't know how committed I'm gonna to get to this, that's why I wanna do a project to experiment with it. The other experiment on this project is using the doing the step design that I've talked about in a, quite a few of my past projects, but doing it with a lot more intention. What I've done in the past with that step design is I always go through and I start by milling all of my pieces to one single thickness. So whether it's three quarters of an inch, whatever I decide I want my thickness to. What I'm doing different on this project is I'm taking each of my different depths or thicknesses and intentionally milling all of my pieces to that thickness right from the beginning. So the outer leg structure are all starting at 3 quarters of an inch, our cross stretchers are at 11 16 and then our the side vertical pieces are going to be at 5 8 Now the one challenging part about doing starting with all these different thicknesses is that you have to intentionally offset your grooves, your joinery and all that kind of stuff. But interestingly enough, I actually found this to be a very beneficial thing to do because what I've, a big problem I've had recently is I just kind of get in the flow of a project. So I just start slapping out the joinery, you know, I throw the piece in the mortiser, not really paying too much attention. I start cutting tenons quickly on the table saw, all this kind of stuff. And it's very easy to make mistakes when you're moving fast and you're not double checking yourself. So while I was working on this project uh, with these different offset, uh, this offset joinery, these offset grooves and that, I really had to kind of slow down and focus more on what I'm doing. Because the interesting thing is on these tenons, the three sides that I'm having to pass over the table saw here with the dado stack, none of them are at the same depth to each other. So every single time I had to stop and I had to adjust the table saw blade before cutting each shoulder of the tenon. And this just really made me slow down and get an absolutely perfect fit every single time on every single tenon. So this was just really interesting to me, and this is it. And this is probably some of the best mortise and tenon joinery I have ever cut. It's super accurate. Everything came out almost perfectly aligned. I was I was genuinely impressed when I actually dry fit this whole thing after cutting the joinery here. It was very interesting, and I did. I managed to do all of my haunch tenons and all that, everything properly. Again, I can't I can't express this enough how interesting it was to see just the difference between the pieces and the way that I've done them in the past. Moving on to the legs now, we're going to be using to join the leg pieces together is a long grain bevel. Now this is a really good way of making kind of post legs uh, because it lets you save a little bit of money on material because you're only working with three quarter inch stock and you're not, you know, you don't have a whole bunch of excess material on that leg. But it is a little bit more time intensive because obviously you have to do a whole nother glue up here. But I do think that it's well worth the effort because it just looks so good. And especially with all of my leg pieces here, I made sure that when I was taking them off of the eight quarter piece of stock I was working from to make sure that I went through and kept them in their book matched pairs. So we basically have a perfect grain wrap around both sides of these legs. And we, later on, when, once we stain them, we kind of lose that book match. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't pop out as much as it did, which is one of the downsides to staining, obviously. But it is a nice subtle detail that I always try to do when I do my legs like this. And again, it's, it's it's not that it's a simpler or a cheaper option, it's just that it's some projects it is the better option because in some cases it can open up just a little bit of extra space on your internal structure. So the important thing here though is to make sure you go through and clean them up. Now this is where I found a rabbiting block plane is the easiest possible thing you can do here. So you're just going to take a nice light shaving until that glue squeeze out on the inside is gone, making sure to work from both faces. This, this is the absolute best way I found to clean these up. Then on the outside face I can just use my hand plane. The one thing you have to be very careful of here is to not take too much material off of one side uh, because you'll end up damaging your miter and kind of ruining the illusion that we're trying to create here. All I'm doing here with these super fine shavings is just knocking off 
pop that glue squeeze out and I'll finish everything off with sanding later on. Then I'm gonna go over to the corner and just round over that miter. Now, whenever you do a long grain bevel like this, you're always gonna get small gaps. This just allows you to go in and slightly curve over your pieces so that it fills in that material. Now you can use a screwdriver, anything, any piece of hard round metal, uh, and this just is gonna fill those small gaps and make your miters look perfect. Then to add in a little bit of a more open or lightweight nature to the nightstand, I decided to go in and add a nice big curve to all of my stretchers. So the bottom three stretchers on the side and the back, and as well as both stretchers on the front, we're just going in and adding a one inch deep curve. And this is a good opportunity for me to use my number 113, one of my favorite tools just because it's so interesting. Uh, it just allows you to get this perfect curve every single time, super fun tool to use. Of course, it doesn't always work perfectly, so I just go through and finish everything up with a card scraper, and this gives me just perfect curves every single time. So now we can go through and do the dry assembly here. Now the next step is gonna be adding in our dowels. Now this is something that I wasn't thinking about doing originally, but I realized it was gonna be a really cool thing to try. So one of the things I've tried doing in the past is draw boring my mortise and tenon joinery. And the problem with this that I found is that it works really well if you wanna do a good traditional method of joinery, but the problem with it is that once you put that dowel in, the, the piece is locked in place. You can never get that dowel back out. So I knew with this project specifically, there was a lot of stuff I was gonna wanna do to make sure that you know things were gonna work properly, where I'd wanna be able to dry assemble it and have it under some tension. So the process here is we're just gonna drill a hole into the mortise, and then once we have that, we're gonna dry some of this whole thing under some good clamping pressure, and then we're gonna pass the marks onto the tenons. Now, unlike draw boring, all we're gonna do is just drill the hole in our tenon exactly where we mark it. This will give us two perfectly aligned holes so that I know when those two holes line up, this piece is going to be under a good amount of tension. So when I put a dowel, anything in, it's gonna still hold everything together, but it's not gonna permanently lock it in place like you would get from draw boring. Now, again, this has the benefit of I can go through and dry assemble this thing without any clamps and that evolved just by putting some dowel pins in that I can then remove later on when I want to disassemble it. Now it's kind of hard to see here, but this is exactly what I was talking about. So right now I have this back structure fully held together with those dowels in place so that everything is locked together and I can go through and add in this rabbit that's going to eventually hold our back panel. But now we get to move on to our surface prep. Now when it comes to staining, surface prep is the absolute most important thing. And I think the interesting thing when it comes to staining is a lot of people think, you know, I think a lot of people who are not woodworkers think that staining is kind of the cheap option. Uh, and going with natural wood is more expensive. But in my case is if somebody asked me to stain a piece of furniture, I would charge them easily double what I would charge for like a normal piece of furniture. Because the amount of surface prep that has to go into a piece of wood before you can nicely stain it, it's insane. So what I started by doing is I followed up the manufacturer's recommendation of sanding everything up to 150 grit. Then I realized that I should do a test piece before I just jump into my project, and I realized that 150 grit was way too low. Uh, not only did it soak up just a weird amount of stain, but it also, uh, there was just marks everywhere from the sanding. So I went through, re-sanded all my pieces back up to 220 grit, and then I applied my stain. And this gave me just beautiful results. Now again, the important thing here is that I hand sanded all of this from 150 grit all the way up to 220 grit, and that helped limit, you know, swirl marks from random orbital sanders, all those kinds of things. So it's really important when you're dealing with stain to do a really good job with your surface prep and that'll help you get kind of the best results. Now the stain that I'm using here is a water-based pigment stain and I've been doing a lot of learning about this over this past week here which is why I'm, it's very important to mention that this is a pigment stain because what that means is that the stain is very much so sitting on the surface of the wood and can also give you kind of paint-like accuracy in the colors. Overall at this point in time I was actually pretty happy with the color because it was able to give me this nice rich dark brown color that I really want and now again I know this is very close to what Cherry ages to but that's kind of what I want to see as I get to use this thing myself. And now we get to probably the best part of the project is where I decided to make all of my floating panels, shelves, and all that kind of stuff out of cedar. Now, cedar is a wood that I've wanted to work with for so long, but I just haven't found a good reason to. Because the beautiful thing about cedar, if you've never worked with it before, is it is the single best smelling wood that has ever existed. And the stuff that I'm using here is just some simple 2x6 material from Home Depot. So it's not even like good quality cedar or freshly milled, anything like that. And it just made the shop smell amazing. Quite literally from the first moment that I cut into this cedar until the very end of this project, the shop has just smelled amazing. I can't, I can't stress this enough. And so that's, that's the whole reason why I'm using it here is because I just want to kind of see how it comes together. 
because in my recent project where I did that small side cabinet, I talked about using cheaper m lumber from like home, home stores and that, and how it actually worked out surprisingly well for the drawer boxes. So I was also thinking with that kind of same philosophy of, you know, what about cedar? Uh, and I'm actually, I'm very impressed to say that I like cedar a lot. Now the side panels here are actually kind of a weird construction because you can see I have those slats that I fit into the outside grooves and I'm now gluing in these inside pieces. Now this actually works surprisingly well. These panels are not insanely strong, but they also don't need to be. And as long as you make sure you don't get any glue squeeze out permanently gluing that, that panel to the frame, uh, you don't, you're gonna be just fine. And what's interesting about this is it takes these individual slats and basically turns them into one solid panel without any kind of like tongue and groove joinery in that. You can see here just how I can remove now that solid panel compared to the slats before. Then you just have to go through and fill in the pin nail holes again, not a hard thing to do, and you can just get this really interesting looking panel at the end. So again, not something I would use for like to build a tabletop or something, but it is great for these floating panels. There is one downside to it though, as you'll see in just a moment here, I'm pretty sure a lot of you guys can guess exactly what is going to happen. And a little hint here for those of you that are still uh, sitting in anticipation, basically I did not put enough glue into our middle section. So here we go. Now there's a quick moment of stress here, but then I quickly realized that it's not that big of a deal. Again, these panels are not meant to be structural. They're not carrying any weight. And that, the way that this panel just broke right here, nothing actually broke. It's just a matter of I didn't put enough glue on that middle piece and it didn't hold those seams together nicely. So I just took a bead of super glue, put that in there, let this piece dry for a little while. And now that I have it in the finished nightstand, there's absolutely no issues. That This problem is never going to happen again because the pieces are locked together. You know, there, there's no way for them to come apart. So that was really nice. Then we get to move on to our stained pieces. And this is where the magic of water-based stains kind of comes out. Because when you first apply, or when you apply a water-based stain, it's gonna be very, very disappointing. The color is gonna go super flat. It's just gonna be very, you know, uninspiring. But then when you take an oil or any, really any finish and apply it over that water-based stain, that's where the color really pops and it just brings out all this interesting stuff. And the lovely thing here is because I'm using a water-based stain, I can just use my normal tried and true oils over that and the oil doesn't pick up the water-based stain. The, you know, the pigments in the stain are not oil soluble, so they can't be picked up when I'm rubbing on the tried and true oils. And this allowed me to just get a really nice natural finish on this, on this project, you know, one that I really like. Then, like I've talked about a few times here, we're going to be using some dowels to pin those mortise and tenon joints. Now again, you could go, you know, pretty simple and make your dowels either by using a dowel form or a dowel cutter. I went through and made all 16 dowels for this thing on the lathe, going through and rounding over each one and then perfectly fitting them into the tenons here. And this was such an awesome thing to do. I, I was so impressed with myself at this point in time because it just looks so cool. And the, the beautiful thing about this is because of the way we're gonna be gluing these in, we're gonna end up with that stained cherry and then these little, you know, these little pinpoints of white oak sticking around. And I went with white oak just because I felt it was a very similar color to, uh, to cedar, uh, but without the weakness, the inherent weakness of cedar. So this was just one of the single, like this, the way that this project came together, I can't describe it in words, but I was just so happy with it. And uh, during the glue up here, I also decided to use hide glue just because it has the least effect of any squeeze out or anything that I get. It's gonna not really affect the finished piece. So at this point in time, as I'm doing the glue up, this is basically the nightstand, the structure of the nightstand was fully completed. And that is just such an awesome thing to, to do. Uh, because in the past, I've kind of bounced back and forth as to whether or not pre-finishing is a good thing to do. Uh, and I think that the, the kind of the mindset that you have to have if you want to pre-finish a project is pre-finishing is definitely easier, but you got to make sure that if you're going to pre-finish it, there's nothing you have to do to it after the glue up. So there's no joiner that you have to flush up, nothing like that. You have to make sure that when you do the glue up, that is the absolute last step. And that's exactly what I did here. And it worked out perfectly. It gave me such an amazing result. Now you can see here that I had a little bit of hide glue. Uh, I did put an excessive amount in this mortise and we did get a little bit of squeeze out. But as I wipe it away, you can see that it doesn't damage the finish whatsoever. And you know, there really was no issues. So that is one of the nice things about hide glue is that it's not really going to cause issues. And then as we pound in the little dowel here, this is what pulls the joint together perfectly tight and just holds everything. And we got that little bit of protrusion, which just looks so, so very good.
Now the last important thing to mention here is you can see that I'm doing my glue ups in a very intentional way. The part that is always holding the glue is always downwards. And that way I don't have to worry about the hide glue flowing out of the mortise and dripping onto other pieces. Now this is a problem that I've caused so many times in the past, uh, just because that's the way it always made sense. If you have a piece that has all the tendons and that sticking upwards, you drop the other piece on top of that. But that's really a bad way to work when you're working with a glue like hide glue, which is super liquidy and you know just flows super easily. Doing it this way just allows you to fully avoid any of that glue dripping all over the place. So you can see here, we're no clamps and we're fully glued up. Onto the drawers now, this is where I also had to get a little bit creative because I, I didn't want to go out and buy 2x8 material, 2x8 cedar material because that was insanely expensive. There's a, there's a massive price difference, surprisingly enough, between 2x6 and 2x8 material, so that was just way too expensive. So what I figured I could do, because my bottom drawer needs to be 5.5 inches wide, and if you guys don't know, dimensional lumber is never what they actually sell it as, so the 2x6 that I had was actually about five, five, five and maybe a quarter, I think, if, if I remember correctly. Uh, so that's just obviously not wide enough to get that, that five and a half inch bottom drawer that I wanted. So what I decided is to just glue these strips of walnut to the outside of the two by six material. And this has two awesome purposes. For one, it gets the piece up to the width that I need. That's obviously the most important part. But the second thing is that it actually adds resistance to the drawer and that adds a little bit of strength because cedar is an insanely soft wood. It's only about 350 on the Jenka hardness scale. So if we're running these cedar drawers over the harder cherry for its whole life, you know, cherry is about six, around 600 on the Jenka hardness scale, the bottom of the drawers could very easily get dented, damaged, just or just kind of worn out over time. Uh, and that's gonna make your drawers end up fitting looser and all that. So by putting those walnut strips on there, it gives us a harder wearing surface, because again, walnut is almost the same hardness as cherry. So it's gonna give us a harder wearing surface, which means these drawers are just gonna last longer. And the kind of the bonus thing of this is that it just made the drawers look kind of cool. Because the walnut is just in its finished form is just slightly darker than the, the stained color of the cherry, it basically gives us these two shadow lines around the top and the bottom of the drawers. And again, I just think it's a really interesting look. It's very, it's just visually different. Now you don't really notice it, which is actually kind of a cool thing, but it, yeah, it's just, it adds this interesting touch that makes the drawers a little bit different. I also decided on these drawers to try gluing up my box joints here with hide glue. Now I think it was even on the last project where I did the painted cabinet where I said that you should never glue up box joints with hide glue because it's not really a strong glue like, you know, type bond or any other PVA glue. Hide glue is really not great in, in situations where the glue is going to be under stress. But I decided that uh, I was going to test that out because that's just the knowledge that I had when I said that is just stuff that I've heard other people say. I've never tested it for myself. And I, I actually think, you know, through a little bit of testing that I've done, that hide glue probably should work. And so far, I have to say that these drawers have not had any issues. I was able to hand plane them. I've been able to use them fairly consistently now. And there's no creaking, no cracking. These box joints are held together really, really well. The one issue I did run into here is that cedar is an absolutely horrible material for your drawer boxes, especially because the way that I fit them up is usually with a hand plane. Cedar has a tendency to tear out like crazy. So you're gonna have to do a lot of sanding after your hand planing, after your fit up. So you gotta make sure you account for that. You know, I had to go with these with like 120 grit after I hand planed them to make sure I got through all of the nasty tear out. But once I got everything done, I'm again, super happy with the finish of these drawers. I think they came out looking really nice and I'm excited for how they're gonna smell in the future here because that cedar is gonna slowly let off that beautiful smell for the next year or so. For the drawer supports, we're not doing anything super fancy here, just taking a couple pieces of maple, basically cutting a groove onto one, a tenon on the other, and then screwing those together. This gives us that nice L shape that also helps support the drawer, uh, as well as guide it. Because you have to remember, with the way that we built these legs, there's nothing between these legs. There's about a three quarter inch gap between our side walls and where the drawer needs to be. So we need to make sure we fill that gap so that the drawer can't veer off track, anything like that, and kind of get jammed up. So this worked really well. This was a nice, quick and easy way to make these drawer supports. And that's the thing with drawer supports or drawer slides is that they don't need to be fancy. You can do them fancy, but they're kind of, I don't know, they're never gonna be seen, so it's not that big of a deal. But again, using maple here just means that they're gonna last a nice long time. So moving on to the tabletop and the middle shelf, these components are, they were a lot of fun to build because at this point in the project, I just decided that I wanted to do a really, really good job on both of these components. I'm not sure what kind of kicked in, but I think it was just kind of seeing the whole structure of the nightstand come together and how good it looked. 
I really just wanted to put the same, you know, intense amount of effort into these other components. Now, that's not to say that, and you know, on other projects, I let myself slack off on, you know, tabletops and, and shelves and that. It was just here. I just, I don't know. I was so inspired by what I'd done before that I wanted to make these really, really well put together. So you can see here, we're just taking the time to go through the process. And just as I work through each of these pieces, I'm just focusing so much on where I'm lining up the blade, where I'm putting all these things. And I think the most interesting thing that I decided to do here was to start by making everything to the same thickness because you remember earlier in the video, that's what I said I specifically didn't do. Now the difference here though is that I want everything to come out basically as flat as possible. So my goal in the end with these pieces was on both the shelf and the top, I wanted the front and back, the full length pieces to be at the exact same level and thickness and all that as our middle panel because we have our middle panel that's going to be made of cedar and then our outer frame is going to be made from cherry. So it's really important that on both of these things that those are flat with each other and then our side pieces of the frame are going to be just slightly lower. So by starting with everything at the same thickness, it allowed me to get my grooves perfectly centered on our frame pieces. That way when I perfectly center the tenon on the floating panels, everything is going to sit exactly where I want it to sit. So there's really no one one size fits all solution. Sometimes it's better to you know make your pieces all to one thickness and then work your way down from there. In other times, like when you're building the structure, it's better to intentionally step down your pieces and all that during the milling process to kind of start out. But again, we're doing the same thing on the frames of both the tabletop and the shelf here with the dowel holes and just making sure that they are a nice tight hole. We're not draw boring, we're just making a nice tight pinhole that's gonna help hold the structure together when I do the glue up as well as as I'm trying to fit up the floating panel in that. So you can see this is a perfect example of how this goes together. As soon as we put in those dowels, that frame just locks perfectly in place. Again, the cedar panels, I can't stress this enough, the shop just was smelling so wonderful at this point in time. And you can see I'm just going through and I'm using a dado stack to add a tenon onto all sides of these floating panels. Now this is pretty different from what I've done in the past because normally what I would do is use a raised panel bit in my router. But with the cedar being as kind of tear out crazy as I was finding it to be, I was afraid that the router would just do insanely nasty things. So I decided to just go with the table saw and add a, little, a small chamfer later on. Now what you're seeing me do here is the front piece of the middle shelf. It needs to kind of sit around that front edge because we have that three quarter inch offset because of the way that we made the legs that that piece has to now sit around. So I just cut out a small amount of material. Then on the back side where the shelf has to go in, I realized that I couldn't kind of glue up and drop in the shelf the way that I'd planned. I was going to have to slide the shelf in place. You're going to see this in a moment here as we do the glue up for it. But basically I just needed this small cutout on the back that I could then slide the back piece through. So this kind of offers two things, is it also locks the back side of the shelf perfectly in place so it can't wobble around, but it just kind of made sure that I could actually get the shelf where I needed to be. And you can see here, I need to be able to slide the shelf in so that that front edge can go in and around those that kind of L-shaped leg. Then again, we go through and do all of our very, very important surface prep. So we're gonna start by putting bevels on all of our outside edges. We're gonna take our outside two pieces of the frame or the side pieces of the frame and step them down by about a 16th of an inch, sand everything up to 220 grit, apply stain, apply oil, and then the very last step is going to be the glue up. So thank you guys for making it this far into the video. If you feel like I've earned it, please hit that like button. It really helps out my videos just kind of get out to the wider YouTube audience. And if you like my content in general, please make sure you hit that subscribe button and I would love to have you guys join the community. Uh, if you're interested in supporting the channel further, I've got a link down in the description to become a member on the channel. This just means that you get free access to all of my digital all plans and SketchUp files and all that for every project I do going forward here. And I've got a whole, a whole exhaustive library of all the products I've done in the past already up there. So if you guys are willing to help me out there, I would really appreciate it. But even just hitting that like button and subscribing massively helps out my channel. And thank you again for making it this far into the video. The glue up for the tabletop was just like the rest of the project. Very easy, just making sure that I'm aligning my pieces and holding them in a way that the glue, the hide glue is not going to drip or squeeze out or, you know, really get in any places that I don't want it to. So we start by putting the sides on and then dropping that vertically into our front stretcher. Then doing the same thing on the back side, just making sure that the whatever mortise is holding the glue is always oriented vertically so that that glue cannot run anywhere. Then once I have that all together, I can pound my little dowels and this thing is ready to go. So this is just such an awesome way to work. And it just, it's so, it's so fun when you can do a glue up and not have to worry about throwing on a ton of clamps and you know that all your pieces are gonna be perfectly aligned. 
For the shelf though, I actually had to glue this in place because what I realized is because I wanted to have the dowels on these pieces protruding just slightly, that meant that I wasn't gonna be able to actually slide the fully glued up shelf in place because those dowels lined up perfectly with the outside edges of the legs. Now this actually looks really cool when in the final piece, but it meant that I had to do this kind of crazy glue up where it was inside of the thing and I had to make sure I didn't get any squeeze out or anything like that. So to say I was slightly stressed here is a kind of an understatement, but it worked out flawlessly. I just made sure that with the hide glue in those front mortises to just let it tack up for a little bit so it wasn't as runny. Then I put my pieces in and it just, again, it worked out lovely because everything went together properly. To attach the tabletop, we're gonna use some simple figure eight fasteners. Now this is, uh, this is again, the simplest way to attach a tabletop I've found. Uh, Cause basically you just put in these little figure eight fasteners and they allow for whatever wood movement you're gonna need. Now the one downside here is I do have the figure eight fasteners tying into the cedar panel. I'd rather have them in the cherry, but the, you know, we just didn't have the size or the space in order to do that. So this will work out just fine. It just means that I don't want to be lifting this nightstand ever by the tabletop. I always want to lift it by the stretchers. And the final step here is to just go through and put a coat of oil over everything. So the final coat here is just meant to make sure that we have good coverage over all of our pieces. There's no areas that I missed. And it just mainly helps get it clean off all of the dust that this thing has accumulated just by existing in the shop here. I don't keep my shop very clean. I try to I keep it as clean as I can, but there's still a lot of dust in the air and that, and that settles on this piece. So going through and applying a final coat of oil and then wiping that off before I bring it in the house, just make sure that it is as clean as absolutely possible. It also lets me just make sure that there's that last level of protection. So as always guys, I do hope you enjoyed this video. If you have any tips or tricks when it comes to staining, I would love to hear them. I'm just kind of starting to figure out this whole staining thing and I, I really am looking for any advice I can get. So if you have any advice, I'd love to hear it in the comments down below. But as always guys, I do hope you enjoyed this video and I will see you in the next one.